dun 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 Insert the music here. Insert the music here. All right. Good morning, tribe, and welcome to Merryweather's World, an hour each week where I talk to you about some of my favorite things with some of my favorite people, about some of my favorite subjects. Uh, it's a favorite of mine. All right. So, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen, creator of Foraging Texas. Ah, the crowd goes wild. So, yeah, uh, Foraging Texas, Idiot's Guide Foraging, the Wazoo Survival Foraging Bandana. And, of course, the Medicine Man line of dietary aids, ancient plants for modern issues. Hey, good evening, Nancy. Good evening, Cynthia. Good evening, Deanna. Good evening, Kathleen. Good evening, Kimberly. Good evening, Tina. Howdy. All right. As usual, uh, starting with the housekeeping stuff. So, wow, episode 77, according to my notes. So let me throw up some links uh, for, like, again, for people who are just joining in, never before experienced what Meriwether's world is. So like I said, Foraging Texas, uh, currently over 200 edible and or medicinal plants, multiple pictures, all sorts of really good information there. Um, check it out. It's pretty much the center of the whole foraging empire, foraging Texas empire. So cool that. Uh, also let you know now with the cool weather coming here, and actually this weekend, it looks like there is some cool weather coming in. Uh, classes have started up. So you can see there the upcoming classes. Uh, lots going on there. So awesome that. All right. And then, of course, don't forget, uh, you can see all this again later over on my YouTube channel. And currently there, well, man, was, this is episode, whoops, did it go up? Yeah, it, went, man, it looks like it went up. Okay, like I said, this is exit 77. Wow. So there's a lot of information back on YouTube uh, and not only Merriweather's World, but hours and hours of the donut shop at the beginning of the world, a whole bunch of my stuff on emergency preparedness and lots of things like that. Ooh, quick question. Yes, Michelle. Good evening, Michelle. Any classes in uh, East Texas? I will be out at Cato Mounds Historic Site October 5th. Um, yeah, so that's out in Alto, Texas. And then I'll be kind of in North uh, Eastern Texas, kind of more towards Dallas, December 5th, um, things like that. But yeah, definitely check out the upcoming classes, see if there's one near you. All right, so along with uh, what I give you, like I said, there is my book, Idiot's Guide Foraging. And I put a link there. And just a reminder, the way the Idiot's Guide series works is they find an idiot to write a book. Uh, I don't get any royalties from this. So the only way... You get anything is, or I get anything, you get lots of stuff. But if the only way I get anything is from you going through the specific link I posted there, and then Amazon pays me a sales commission of 79 cents. And for those of you who've never seen it, so each thing, big pictures, uh, for some reason, if you're not in Texas, I'm trying to get this up to the, oops, wrong side up to the camera there. So it like has the map of North America, multiple pictures, when to look for it. Is there an edible or a poisonous mimic? How to use it? Everything you need to know to describe it, define it, discover it. And of course, recipes too. So yeah, Idiot's Guide Foraging. Follow the link for probably the best foraging book out there. Sorry, Sam Thayer. Okay, and then for lots of other, not just foraging-related stuff, but uh, plant stuff, ethnobotanical stuff, how to become a forager stuff, 
hurricane gear, emergency gear, things like that. Of course, the shop foraging Texas uh, through Amazon. And just a reminder, anything you purchase through there, it gets me about a 6% sales commission. And then, of course, there is, let me throw this up here. Do, do, do. Can I do this? Yeah. Oh, come on, you. There we go. So not only are there lots of products. Oops. Yeah. Save for later. Go away. Let me shut that there. Yeah. Okay. Ignore that. But yeah, there are the different skin beer, uh, skincare and more importantly, the dietary supplements come out by Medicine Man. So check it out. All right. Back to me. And by back to me, I actually mean, let's look at some of the other sponsors. So of course, Wazoo Survival. Like I said, they are the ones that uh, worked with me and Dr. Nicole Appellian to create the Wazoo Forging Bandana, gorgeous thing here. The 12, what we decided were the 12 most important edible slash medicinal plants for a person to know uh, with big pictures and how to use it and what parts you can, what parts you can't and whatever warnings and anything like that. So really, really good. And also, of course, I, I always have to give a shout out to Wazoo Survival because they are the ones that pay for the StreamYard account that I am using to get to you. So yay them. They are awesome. Okay. And just as awesome. Bum, bum, bum. And oops, let's bring this up. Oh, let me do this. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Uncommon bees for any of your bee related stuff. And so, did it go up? Let me uh, hit return there. Okay. And so, not only do they have, you know, the beeswax and all sorts of beeswax based uh, cosmetics and skincare products and everything like that that they make using their bees here in Texas. They have tons of infused honeys with different uh, herbs and mushrooms and flavors and citric and garlic and you know echinacea and like this espresso infused honey, rosemary infused honey. And they do the freeze drying and the powdering and the grinding and the infusing all in their location out in Jasper, Texas. And for the lady who asked about uh, East Texas classes. Uh, I taught there just two weeks ago and I will be back there sometime in the spring, like I said, out in Jasper, Texas. So definitely check out Uncommon Bees. I got the coupon right now. If you use the term, the special Foraging Texas coupon code, Forking Weeds, you get, what do you get? You get 25% off between now uh, and, the, and, and actually uh, 9.30 tonight. So that's awesome. They got good stuff. Okay, and since we're talking about herbs, uh, let's also throw up the herb shop. So, Ricardo Shilly Shally, yeah, yeah, I know I'm live. I can see, I can hear myself. Let me have this close. That's the thing when you're like trying to share Facebook stuff. So, Ricardo Shilly Shally at Herbs uh, out in Cushing, Texas, East Texas. This is the place I go to to get my raw herbs and also certain blends. Um, including the Battle Mage Tea blend. Whoops, no, nope, that's what I wanted. So uh, the great thing about herbs, if you contact him, he will sit down with you with like a Zoom meeting if you can't drive there and figure out just what would be the appropriate thing to use with you and then send it out to you. So that is a good thing to do. Okay, next one, Campcraft Outdoors. Like I said, I spend a lot of time off trail because that's where all the good mushrooms are. And, well, and by good, I mean edible folks. So I need backpacks and gear and gear carriers that can handle tearing through thorns and brush and all sorts of things that would tear apart a plastic backpack. So Campcraft Outdoors, fine makers of excellent canvas products, nice uh, you know, heavy duty canvas, but still lightweight in weight, hand waxed to make sure that it is waterproof. Always a good thing. And with their coupon code, uh, oh, it's Foraging Texas gets you a 15% discount. 
Uh, also going back to herbs, the coupon code forking weeds gets you 15% off between now and midnight. So definitely check out oops, the Campcraft Outdoors for any sort of really different ditty bags, haversacks, food bags, saw carriers, axe carriers, cook set carriers, canteen carriers, and even cool hats now that it's winter. And I haven't seen these uh these wool hats yet so these are something new always exciting okay not done thank you for hanging in there as i get through the sponsors because remember these are the people that help me bring all this information to you so uh let's go one more here we got fear and dread so remember uh two weeks ago we had the drawing of some really amazing first aid kits donated by fear and dread uh, great things. Hopefully the people, they were shipped out. I haven't heard anything back from the people. But uh, in this time of weird uncertainties, they got the stuff you need to make your life a little less uncertain. Uh, and their coupon code uh, is Merryweather. So 5% off orders of 100 or more. And it is really easy to come with orders of 100 or more. Okay, one more, and one of the biggies, Arbor True, perhaps the best tree doctors in the nation. If you have trees that need to be pruned, let's say some pine trees like we talk about tonight, these are the people you need to call. They're based in Kingwood on the kind of the northeast side of Houston, but they travel not only all over Texas, but all over the nation. They were out last year with California's big forest fires, helping take down a lot of dangerous trees out there. They're out, they got teams out in Louisiana from Hurricane Laura, and I know they are massing up and getting ready to head off to the Florida with Hurricane Sally. So, but they still have people here for you. And not only do they do amazing work, but they have the scientific laboratory to actually analyze what may be attacking your tree. It could be something as simple as a nutritional deficiency. It could be something as deadly as a particular fungus. Um, but they can go through and figure out what the best option is. And right now, they also have a special treatment where because they are scientists that decided to be tree doctors rather than tree doctors that decided to be scientists, um, they have scoured the world for some really neat bacteria that works as a nitrogen-fixing bacteria for any plant. Normally, when you think about nitrogen-fixing bacteria, if you think about those sort of things, uh, you would be thinking about legumes, you know, the pea plants and alfalfa and how they're great at vetch, how they're great at restoring nitrogen to the soil. Well, with the Rhodosomodimonas polsteris, and I have no idea if I pronounced it right, but they uh, have the thing that works for basically hitting up your plants and making them nitrogen fixers. And I am just throwing up all the links because I was busy talking and not linking. And uh, of course I want to link to these people so you know how to get to them. All right. And whoops, did that not go up? Spinny, spinny, spinny. Sometimes I move too fast for Facebook. Why is that spinning, spinning, spinning? Oh, well, all right. It didn't like it. So be it. I didn't like it. On we move. Uh, let's see. And, of course, uncommon bees. Whew. Okay. I need a drink of water. And it is only water tonight. All right, I saw lots of people show out, so a big hello to all of you, rather than running through the names, because you know who you are, just seeing if there's anyone I don't recognize. Oh, oh. hey, Lori. All right, okay, so people are here. Silver Lining Villages, greetings and salutations. And Vivian Lewis. Hello, hello. Okay, dun, dun, dun. Let me remove that. Oops. Oh, okay, good. So now I actually have a presentation 
for you. All right. So uh, before we get to it, come back. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. So pine trees, uh, lots of pine trees in Texas. You're going to find out just how many pine trees here in a few moments, but there's lots of other cool stuff you'll be discovering too. Um, especially how to eat a pine tree, how to drink a pine tree, and otherwise how to incorporate pine trees into your daily life uh, in a caveman way without being a caveman, cave person. Okay, so let us jump right in. Bum, 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 and first start out with the numbers and just some really interesting facts about pine trees. First, these are old trees. They have been around now for about 140 million years. The oldest known fossils were found in Nova Scotia, and they're tiny. The individual fossils were only about five millimeters long, the parts, but they were able to figure out from that, studying the vascular structure and some of the other things, because they were so well preserved that they were able to say, damn, this is a pine tree from 140 million years ago. In North America, a uh, number of species, there are 79 different pine trees uh, available. And the picture here is from the USDA uh, subordinate tax uh, image of all the different species of pine trees and where they are found. Of these 79, 11 are non-native. So there are some pine trees that have been brought in from overseas because, hey, they got pine trees all over the world. Texas has 12 species of pine trees. Uh, this is equal to 32 million commercial acre, or sorry, 3.2 million commercial acres of the pine trees. And I pulled up some numbers. Uh, let me just escape here for a second. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, let me pull this up here. Why aren't you unviewifying? Ah. Okay. So to put things in perspective, um, we have around 7 million acres of cotton, uh, 5,000 and some acres of wine grapes. We have around 3,000 3, acres of peanuts. And there was one other that I looked up uh, about an hour ago, and now my short-term memory doesn't have it. But yeah, so East Texas in particular has a lot of acres of pine. Anyone who's hiked through some of the national forests and so forth have seen where they have you know, harvested the pine and planted new ones, especially up in the Davy Crockett and the Sam Houston National Forests. Of the commercial pines, the loblolly and the longleaf are supposedly the two main ones that they use. So you know, go lob lolly and longleaf. There's a lot of commercial use for those. All right. I need to keep an eye out here. All right. Okay. So of the different pine trees, if you're really interested, here are the different species. Um, the one thing that I find amusing is a Sonder, Sonderegger pine uh, down here. It is actually a hybrid between the longleaf pine and the loblolly pine. So again, in East Texas, the two most common ones, the loblolly pine and the longleaf pine, they have babies and it becomes the Sondergerrigger pine. Who knew? Who knew? But yeah, if you're out in East Texas, most likely you're going to find the loblolly, the longleaf. If you go out West Texas, you get more of the ponderosa and some of the pinions, Mexican pinion. Uh, and then there are a few other. The slash pine, uh, Pinus eliati, is also out in East Texas some, and others are just randomly strewn across the state. But big trees, a lot of commercial uh, value uh, to the state of Texas. Uh, I believe you can get agricultural ex exemptions on your land if you maintain the pine trees for, for harvesting. But we're not here to talk about you know, commercial uses. We're here to talk about how to eat a pine tree. So let's jump into that. Let's eat, if you will. 
So yeah, there's all sorts of ways of eating a pine tree. So we're going to go through that. Not only eating it, but drinking it and maybe even using it medicinally. Okay, so let's start with the baby pine tree. Little baby, baby, baby pine, baby pine. So this is actually my favorite pine food, if you will. The little tiny seedlings where they're still really nice and tender. They look like a little baby beaker from the Muppet Show, except with green hair. So these I'll just pick out of the ground and eat raw. You know, I may, if there's a seed still attached, I'll pinch that off and leave it behind the seed, the root, mainly because of dirt. I don't like eating more dirt than I have to. And I probably eat a lot more dirt than most people, but just pinched off. But flavor wise, the little seedlings kind of taste like rosemary. They're not just pine. They actually have a, a little more of an herbal flavor to them. And so really good as a, uh, just a snack food, really, especially around all sorts of pines. Ooh, Kathy has a good question here. So do pinion and white pine survive in East Texas? None that I know of. I have not found anyone or any record of the pinion. And same with the white pine, unfortunately. The white pine was all over up north, but it generally requires uh, colder weather for its reproductive cycle. And so it doesn't do well here unfortunately, which is a bummer because the inner bark, when we start talking about that, the white pine inner bark is probably the most delicious of the different pine barks. It always reminded me of bacon. Okay. So eating the seedlings, yum. Let's do that. Uh, they're popping around all over. And I noticed the pine cones are ripe right now. And we'll talk about how to tell when they're ripe uh, in a bit. But so that means they'll be dropping the seeds and then we're going to have new baby seedlings. Yum. Okay. Now the big one, the needles. Let's talk about the needles. Uh, the pine trees are a traditional source of vitamin C. So the vitamin C content in the needles, depending on the particular soil, growing conditions, age of tree, time of year, all those different factors come into play into how much vitamin C is present. And, but generally it's going to be somewhere between 0.7 and 1.9 milligrams per gram of fresh green needles. So not needles you found on the ground, not brown needles, not dehydrated needles, but fresh off the tree. So 0.7 to 1.9 milligrams per gram of fresh needle material. For comparison, oranges have 0 0.045 milligrams per gram of orange, fresh orange. Lemons have 0.53 milligrams of vitamin C per gram of fresh lemon. So yeah, the pine needles have more vitamin C in them than lemons and oranges. Pretty amazing. The recommended daily allowance, RDA of vitamin C, is 100 milligrams a day. So that means you generally have to consume or make tea from between 53 grams and 143 grams of pine needles. So a good way to measure that out is just grab a handful of pine needles off the tree. And you know how like you measure spaghetti for a bunch of people where you, you know, just make a, a fist like that? And however many spaghetti, spaghetti noodles fit in there, that's you know the right amount for X number of people. Same thing with pine needles. Figure about the size of a 50 cent piece. For those of you that remember when we had cones. Okay, this is weird. This is my dad calling. I don't know if I should answer it. Uh, he knows I'm doing the show, hopefully. Actually, I can hand it to... Would you mind talking to dad? Thank you. Okay. It's locked. Uh, oh, well, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So 50, uh, 50 cent piece size clump of fresh green pine needles to get the pine needles. Um, you notice at the very top here where it says don't boil. So remember vitamin C is not temperature stable for every minute above 180 degrees Fahrenheit, you lose about 10% of the vitamin C present in the food 
uh, that you're you're cooking. So if you're boiling it, that's even higher, so you're gonna lose even more. So it's really recommended that you bring water to a boil, let it cool some, then add the pine needles to it and let it soak for you know, 30 minutes, strain out the pine needles and then drink it and then you'll get the vitamin C. Now remember also the vitamin C is trapped inside the cell walls. So you need to chop up the pine needles really fine. You need to crush the pine needles really fine. You need to rupture those cell walls to get the vitamin C out. Okay, uh, a couple of questions here. Michelle, can all varieties of pine trees be consumed? Yes. If it is a member of the pinus species or uh, pinus genus, yes, it is safe to consume. Um, later on, we will get to one particular danger uh, that you need to keep in mind, but isn't you know, all that dangerous, uh, at least not from a scientific studies point of view. And then also there are certain things that are called pine trees that are not true pines. A really good example is the Norfolk pine, the Norfolk pine, which is used in uh, uh, house plants actually quite a bit. It looks like a pine tree. It is not a true pine tree. I don't remember the exact species name, but it is not pinus, not a member of the pinus genus, and it can actually be very uh, poisonous. But otherwise, yes, all the other pine trees, in particular, all the pine trees you will be finding here in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, all that, the true pines, these work for all of them. Okay, Cleo's asking, did sailors know about vitamin C in the needles? Could they have taken them on voyages to prevent scurvy? No, they did not. Uh, from what I could tell from the ethnobotanical studies is it was fairly unknown over in the Western world. I don't know about Asia. I wasn't able to find anything on that, um, but it was fairly known uh, by the, the natives here in North America that it was one of the things they drank to avoid scurvy. They know if they made tea from the pine needles, they would not lose their teeth. So, okay, and, and just a side note, scurvy. Let's you know, go sideways here for a second. The... Uh, Scurvy is what happens when you can't heal the damage done uh, to your gums from eating hard things. Your gum tissue is designed to be really abused as humans eat all sorts of nuts and, and you know, things like that and non bones and so forth. And so the gum tissue knows it's going to get damaged and so it heals really quickly if there's vitamin C present. If there's not vitamin C, then that little nicks and cuts and, and gashes to your gums can't heal. They get worse and worse and worse to the point where your gums rot, your teeth fall out, and that's the beginnings of scurvy. Okay. I see everyone yelling, answer it, answer it, answer it. And I'm not sure if you are talking about can all varieties be consumed. Remember, uh, when you're using pronouns on here, because the comments show up sequentially, I don't necessarily know what the pronoun is referring to. So we'll keep that in mind. Okay, so generally tea is the main thing people will do with needles, but there are also some wonderful recipes out there for pine needle shortbread cookies, where again, you chop up and crush really, really fine, like put it in a food processor and powder the needles and mix that with the shortbread cookies to give a nice... Uh, a nice uh, pine flavor sort of thing. So, oh, the phone call. You want me to call my dad now? <laughs> that, that could go for a long time. Okay. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a moment here. And we're going to call mom and dad. I'll put it on speaker. Hey, what's up, Dad? Oh, we were just wondering when the Cass's confirmation was. Uh, a few years from now. Kiki's oh. will be the 25th, though. <laughs> oh, a couple of years from now. We yeah. thought it was coming up now. No, no. Kiki's confirm. Uh, 
Anyway, okay, I'm actually, you're live being listened to by hundreds of people. Yeah, so, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I was proud of it. That's why I hung up. I was going to oh, look it up. Okay. I forgot about it. I'm going to bring it up on the thing. We'll talk to you later then. Okay, love you. Bye-bye. Bye. We were married in 66. Bye. Bye, married in 66. Okay. Okay, we're back. <laughs> So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, just this morning it came up wondering how long my parents have been married. They were married in 1966. So, okay. So, uh, shortbread cookies chopped up really fine. Another thing I like doing is what's called spatchcock chicken, where you it's a, a way of roasting a chicken. If you like crispy flesh, you know, crispy skin on a chicken, try this, where you, you cut out the backbone. You could you know, get your big post-apocalyptic shears, cut through the backbone, and butterfly the chicken open, and lay it on a like a, a big roasting pan, or in my case, I use a giant cast iron pan with a layer of aluminum foil because I hate you know having to clean this big pan afterwards and scrape everything out. Um, but I put a thick layer of crushed pine needles down, and then the chicken over it. And then just stick pine needles elsewhere, crushed up pine needles around it. So, um, and then just roast the thing 500 degrees for, I can't remember how long now, not quite an hour. The skin gets crispy. The resins diffuse out of the crushed pine onto the chicken. Excuse me. And it has a really good flavor. Another thing, uh, infused vodka. You can make kind of a pine gin-like stuff by taking the vodka, chopping up the pine needles, and mix it in there, and infusing the, the resins and the flavors into the vodka for a nice walking through the pine forests of Finland sort of effect. So really, really, really good there. And then finally, a syrup, a simple pine syrup, which basically uh, is two cups of sugar, a cup of... Uh, pine needles between half a cup and a cup. If you get like a full cup in there, sometimes it gets a little thick and hard to strain out. Um, and yeah, so two cups of sugar, one cup of water, you know, be somewhere between half a cup and a full cup of chopped up, crushed up pine needles. Don't powder them. Don't put them in a blender and grind it to powder because you're going to have to strain out, filter out the pine needles uh, before you use this syrup. And so... Uh, if it's too small, it will clog up the filters. So yeah, a pine syrup. Oh yeah. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Thank you, Julie. Uh, spatchcocking the chicken, 20 minutes per pound of chicken. First 10 minutes at 425. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, I have you know, 52 years of experience with my folks and whoops. And I know, uh, I know what to expect from them. And so what's funny is if it's an emergency, dad won't call. <laughs> He'll like tell one of my brothers to contact me, but anyway. Okay. Oh, I'll just throw this out here. Uh, Tamiflu properties versus sweet gum balls, little to none. There is a little bit of shishimic acid in the pine needles, but shishimic acid is just the starting point for Tamiflu. It takes a bunch of chemical processes to turn it into Tamiflu. And just like with the sweet gum, uh, same thing. The sweet gum balls have a lot of shishimic, actually a lot of shishimic acid in there, uh, way more than the pine needles. But in either case, unless you have a fully operational chemistry lab, you're not really going to be able to make Tamiflu or get any Tamiflu-like properties from them. Okay, any questions about... Nope, pine needles. Okay, so that is pine needles. Oh, we got to move fast. All right, let's bring this back up. So now, uh, you know, the pine needles are great, especially, you know, making syrups and cocktails and so forth out of them. The inner bark... So some of you may have watched the show alone, heard me talk about this, and uh, I don't know, was it season four? Three or four, one of the guys uh, was getting, you know, pretty hungry, and he remembered he could eat the inner bark of pine trees, so he started 
uh, peeling away the inner bark and gnawing down and ended up with an obstructed bowels and had to be helicoptered out. Oh. Okay, this is just a... Okay, hold on. Okay, <laughs> sorry. That's the neighbor wanting to know if they can hack onto our uh, Wi-Fi. I, I should probably answer that. Yeah, so hold on. Sorry, I tell you. Okay. Okay. Think. Okay. Stop. Okay. All right. So the cambium layer, that is the edible part of the bark of the pine tree, but you have to do it properly. Otherwise, you will not be able to digest it. You'll just end up with a big blockage of gunk in your gut, which is generally not good. So the xylem and phloem layers, that is the living part of the tree, you know, the, the new growth each year. And luckily it's really easy to strip out of the old growth, but you have to do it in a particular way so that you don't kill the tree. Because you want these trees to be here year after year after year. So you can get this inner bark. And so what's done is called window painting. And this was something, the, the inner bark of the pine trees was a food that was eaten all around the world. Uh, I bring up Finland because Finland are big fans of bark eaters or tree pine tree eaters. The Adir Adirondack Native Americans in up upstate New York, the name Adirondack means the bark eaters. And then in Minnesota, where I'm from, the Ojibwe, which was a offshoot of the Sioux Native Americans, uh, also liked the white pine. So to get it though, you reach up as high as you can, which helps if you're really tall, and cut a horizontal cut, you know, four to six inches wide. You need a big pine tree. The bigger the pine tree, and especially the old growth pine trees that they were doing on this would be, you know, a foot and a half in diameter or more. And then you cut two vertical lines down from the horizontal cut down to about knee height and then cut it off again and peel the strip away. Because remember, you are taking a part of the circulatory system of the pine tree. So if you go in a complete circle all around, you are going to kill the tree. You don't want to do that. You want to just take a strip. And like in Finland, what they do is they had whole forests where... Uh, they do, you know, this tree, you know, or well, one fourth of the trees one year, and then the next fourth of the trees the next year, and the next year, the next fourth, and the next fourth. And then on the fifth year, they'd go back to the first fourth. So they were able to rotate around, you know, the trees. And there are trees, uh, pine trees over in Finland that are, you know, well over 100 years old that have shown signs of being window paned, having these strips taken out for you know a long, long time, for you know dozens and dozens and dozens of decades, really. Well, maybe not dozens and dozens and dozens of decades, but you know what I mean, a long time. Okay, so um, why eat the bark? Because it's loaded with calories and it's really easy to hunt a pine tree. They're very big, they're slow moving, their camouflage is not very good. And so they're, they require very little ways in the ways of stealth to sneak up on a pine tree and take out the strip. And your, your reward is in that cambium layer is between 500 and 600 calories per pound. Now you're thinking uh, doing caveman type stuff, the average human could easily be burning 2,000 calories a day. And so, you know, that'd be like you know, four pounds of pine bark. Yeah, you're probably not going to eat four pounds of pine bark a day. You're going to mix it up with other things, hopefully, to try and fill it up. But if you are reduced to having to eat four pounds of pine bark per day, um, you need to know what to do with it. So, after you peel it off the tree, you have this, this living layer. And actually, do I have... Ah, there we go. Yeah, so you have this living layer. You need to split it into thin strips. Think you need to... It splits like spring... Uh, spring string cheese. So it, it, it comes apart, peels apart really easily. Then you toast those thin slabs. You know, Like I said, get them to the thinness of a potato chip and roast them to the 
crispiness of a potato chip. You want them to be very brittle, brown and brittle, brittle, dark brown. At that point, you can just nibble on it like bacon. Really good, especially the white pine that was asked about earlier. Like I said, up in Minnesota, up in the, we, we called that the bacon tree because it tastes like hickory smoked bacon. Down here, East Texas, the loblolly uh, pine, it's edible. It's a little on the resiny side, a little on the sappy side. Um, but if you don't want to just eat it like potato chips, you can take these thin, thin strips, toast them, get them nice and brittle, and just beat them into flour, pound them into flour to bust them up into a fine flour. At that point, you can then you know, boil it into a porridge. You can use it as a thickening agent in stews or anywhere you would use a gluten-free flour. And it still has that kind of pine resiny flavor. That's really good. But like I said, danger if it's not cooked or if your stomach is not ready for that much sawdust, really, uh, there's a good chance you're going to end up with some bowel obstructions. Uh, one thing, if you are ever planning on going onto the show alone or naked and afraid or any of those things where they dump you out in the wild and you got to eat trees, um, practice first by just roasting some regular oatmeal or quick oats and just be eating, you know, handfuls of that each day. So train your stomach to eat pine bark if you're going on to some of these survival shows or planning on just, you know, going off and living in the wild by eating roasted raw oatmeal. And that will do a long ways towards training your gut bacteria and your overall digestive processes and getting used to the massive amounts of fiber and things like that. So inner bark, really tasty. Um, remember, it does damage the tree. So... Uh, especially down here in the south, you would normally want to paint over the wound with some of the uh, arborist paint that they paint over, you know, when they trim a branch, they paint over the cut to just prevent any from bacteria or anything getting in there. The trees will produce lots of sap, and there's uses for the sap later on. We'll talk about the sap too. Uh, but generally, you know, try and protect the tree. And, ooh, Chad has a good question. So tree trunks only, no, the branches too. If you are pruning branches off a pine tree, like the lob lollies around here, pruning the branches, uh, especially the bigger lower branches, you can peel the inner bark um, off the trunk. The inner bark will be somewhere around uh, one eighth of an inch thick, depending on growing conditions. On the branches, it will be significantly thinner and a little trickier to get off. But if you've already pruned the branch, you can take all the inner bark off the branch and use that. Okay, uh, Silver Lining Villages. Are there any dangerous to eating pine needles? One, if you haven't chopped them up small enough, if you still have bits that are long, brittle, and sharp, there is a risk of a pierced intestine, you know, punctured intestine, which is bad, especially in a survival situation. So that's why just making a tea from them is best or, you know, otherwise infusing them into vodka or, you know, preparing them in a way that you strain them out. If you're making the shortbread cookies, that's when you want to make sure you've ground the pine needles into a powder. And then later on at the end of the show, and wow, I got to go fast. This might be a two week thing here, folks. Uh, there are some dangers for, uh, found with the ponderosa pine in the form of it can cause uh, miscarriages in cattle at a certain point in the cattle's uh, gestation. But we'll talk about that in there. Hey, Ziggy, saying hi to a friend here. Okay. Uh, so that's the inner bark. Dun, 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 inner bark. Good stuff. Oh, mom and dad, if you're watching, I don't know if they're watching, they might be watching. Um, yeah, this is the pine tree out in the backyard, way the far back one away from the house. So if you're ever back there and wonder why there's this chunk out of the tree, it's because I ate it. Okay, moving on, the pine nuts. And from what I can tell, at least the Houston area, the pine, pine cones, which produce the pine nuts, are currently ripe. So let's talk about pine cones. 
uh, most pine trees, it is a two year growth. I suspect on some of the really big ones like the ponderosa pine, it might be even longer, but I don't know for sure. Um, the way to tell when they are ripe is they're still going to be green and tightly closed but the squirrels will be going nuts on them. And so underneath the pine tree, you will see all these stripped pine cones uh, where they have been, each, each one of those scales on the pine cone had one of these seeds and it looks like a, a maple leaf because when the pine cones up on the tree eject the pine nuts, the pine nuts have a little twirly thing, so they go floating away from the pine tree because they don't want to just drop straight down under the shade of the pine tree. They want to get away from the shade of the pine tree and start their own life. Oh, hey, Nathan. Nope, I haven't gotten to the pollen yet. Not sure if I'm going to get to the pollen. Okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I guess the pollen is the next one. So let's talk about the seeds. Seeds high in protein, some calories. Uh, best if you roast them. Uh, roasting them uh, kind of pre-digests them. So then your stomach doesn't have to work so hard to get all the nutrients out of it. So you're able to get more of the nutrients from it if you pre-roast the seeds, like roasted, toasted pine nuts. You do have to peel the wing off. All you want is the little nub at the end. And they are kind of small because, you know, that's like the line on my hand. You know, it's what we're showing there. So the, the individual ones are small but the average pine cone has a bunch of them. So if you're willing to put in the time to tear open the pine cones and with the pliers go through and pull each scale off and then pull each seed out from it, you can end up with quite a few uh, pine nuts fairly quickly. It's a fair amount of work. Uh, what I found, uh, especially uh, using a pair of leather gloves to twist it in half first and kind of break it in half, allows you easier access than with the pliers to get at each scale and pull out the seeds. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can pretend the pine cones are subjected to a forest fire. So pine cones and pines, they're usually in areas that are subjected to forest fires, you know, quite often. Uh, saw a great presentation recently. Is Jackie here tonight? Nope, she's not here tonight. Oh, maybe she's here tonight. Anyway, uh, about the author of 1491, which talked about the natives of South Central and North America before the arrival of Columbus. And there is a great line in there that at least North America was inhabited by a, or a, a continent of pyromaniacs. The Native Americans understood that, you know, lighting uh, grass fires and forest fires all the time uh, had wonderful, wonderful effects, in their opinion, on the ecosystems. Uh, it got rid a lot of the undergrowth, allowed a lot of the small, fresh, green forbs to come up, which then attracted all the animals they wanted to eat, like the bison and the deer and things like that. So by continuously burning places all the time, all across North America, they uh, actually made it a more fertile land for them then to, to live on. Okay, a little digression there. So pine cones, so they are designed that when they feel the heat of a forest fire, uh, they wait a few days, you know, let things cool down, let the fire pass, and then they pop open and start dumping their seeds. And so if you don't want to tear the, 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 the pine cone open, then you just throw them in a big like turkey roasting pan, a bunch of the green pine cones, and then stick them in the oven, 500 degrees, 400 degrees, what is it, 451 Fahrenheit is the ignition point of paper, according to Ray Bradbury. So let's say 450, 475. Pop it in the oven for just a few minutes, not more than five. You don't want to like bake them. You don't want to kill the pine cones. You just want to give them like a minute or two, like the fire is coming by. And then take them out. Yeah, so like, you know, two minutes, like the fire came roaring by really hot and then went by. Take them out, dump in them some big brown paper bags and just let them sit. And they're going to open up and drop the seeds that way. And then you just shake and the seeds fall to the bottom. You pull out the pine cones. You take the wings off the pine cones. You toast the pine nuts and away you go. 
Okay. Um, but whoop, yeah. So, but to tell when they're ripe, like I said, you watch the squirrels. And when suddenly your pine tree underneath is, you know, the ground is littered with the pine cone scales and all these stripped pine cones, that is when the pine, uh, pine cone is ready. Um, another thing you could do, I don't have it on the slide, but the green closed uh, pine cones. If you are familiar with the author Pas uh, Pascal Baldur uh, out in California, amazing forager, amazing chef. He does all sorts of things, you know, with all sorts of plants, and he makes a very nice pine cone syrup. So similar to the simple syrup using the chopped up pine cones, but in this, uh, sorry, simple syrup using the chopped up pine needles. In this case, he is using the intact pine cones and just dropped in there and soaked for a while uh, and heated up to kind of sterilize it, cook the pine cones in the, the syrup, and cap it up, and away you go. So very tasty. Wow, 8.50. And this, I guess we can move on to pollen. Okay, I don't know if you can read that, but that was me writing on my truck it's begun. So in the spring, when East Texas and Houston is covered in this yellow pine pollen, let's talk about the yellow pine pollen. So it is very nutritious. It was collected by, at least here in North America and in Texas, by the Native Americans because it is a good source of protein. It has fatty acids, carbohydrates, calcium, magnesium, vitamin B, vitamin E, and androstenodione, androstenodione. And we'll talk about that one, that last one at the end there. So it was food. And anyone that knows the pine trees, they produce a lot of pine pollen. And so this pine pollen was collected and it's like already flower. You didn't have to do anything to it. It was already powdered. So it was just... Uh, you know, just ready to go. You could, you know, eat it as is. You could boil in a porridge. You could use it to thicken things. So the pollen, and I actually have some here. And I got several slides, so, whoops. So I still have some from the spring. And in this case, it is pine pollen or the pollen bodies in uh, tequila, because you'll understand understand why here in a minute. But the yeah the the oops the main uses for the the pine pollen would be flour or a tincture, especially nowadays. Uh, you can also make a tea out of it, but if you're going to make a tea out of it, you may as well just eat it as is. So you saw at the very end thing in there. There was this long word, androstenedone. And what androstenedone is, is it is the precursor of testosterone. The only difference is this here. The oxygen is a ketone. It is double bonded to this little thing here would be a carbon. Whereas the testosterone, it has been hydrolyzed into an alcohol group. So this is testosterone, which your you know body produces. And this is pine pollen, which pine trees make. But your body produces this too because your body then converts this one into this one. So if you start taking a bunch of pine pollen and you start putting more of this in your body, your body automatically starts converting it into testosterone. Now, the amount in the the pine pollen it varies a lot from species to species time of year and so forth so but generally the pine pollen would be collected in large amounts and then used in large amounts to basically flood the body with testosterone this is particularly important if you were a young native american brave heading off to you know, some battle or to attack some other Native American tribe, something like that. That happened a lot. And so the week beforehand, they would start, you know, gorging themselves on the pine pollen bodies that they had collected. You know, they didn't have them soaked in tequila, 
But hey, tequila plus, plus testosterone, what could go wrong? So they would start doing that. They would flood their body with the, well, it would end up with testosterone and then get all the effects of testosterone flowing through their body. Now, here's the problem with that. And I'm going to bring me back for this. So your body, it goes, okay, I think you need this much testosterone. But then you add something that raises your testosterone level up to here, like from the pine pollen. Your body looks at that and goes, hmm, that's a lot of testosterone floating around. I don't need to make so much. So I'm going to make, you know, down here now. So then when this testosterone that you, you know, got from the pine pollen, you know, goes away, your pine you know, or your, your testosterone level is here rather than here. So you get that, you know, that incredible Hulk thing, and then you turn into a big teddy bear because now your testosterone level is actually really low. So that's why it's recommended a lot of times to don't consider uh, testosterone supplements to be a long-term fix because they're actually going to leave you worse off. There has been some really cool science uh, more recently and some other ways of getting your body to naturally, you know, reset that testosterone thermostat, if you will, to raise it higher and bring out uh, naturally your body producing its own natural testosterone in a higher level because you've, you've taken this setting and said, nope, it should be here. And the body doesn't realize you do it. It just starts producing testosterone up there. Okay. Wouldn't they inhale it? I don't believe so because inhaling fine particles is really a good way to choke. So mainly it was just the, the pollen bodies, you know, these little things in there where the pollen was would be consumed or they would mix it and make like a gruel. But generally, yeah, you, you collect the pollen bodies right when the pollen is first starting to drop very carefully collect that and put it in containers so when they're jostled the pine just doesn't or the you know the pine pollen doesn't escape so uh if you're bored sometime during pollen season pine pollen go out and shake the ends of the branches where these these pollen bodies are and you will see thick yellow clouds coming off them so they would just snip those right at the beginning and hold on to them and then have them ready to go. All right. Uh, let's see. Anyone else? Okay. We might go a little long. Is that okay? We might. This one might stretch a little long because I'd rather get through pine uh, tonight rather than stretch it in the next one. So let's talk about pine pitch. So pine tar, uh, nature's glue, and in particular, a hot glue. So when you get it off the tree and it's gooey and sticky, if you heat it up, the naturally occurring turpentine in it evaporates away and leaves uh, a hard material behind, a hard, glassy, plastic-like material. Not flexible. Glassy would be a better term. And so if you play around with pine, you know it's sticky. You know it dries hard. But the problem is it's brittle. And if there's any flex the dried pine sap breaks and the thing that was glued together no longer stays glued together. Well, this was this problem was solved many, many millennia ago uh, by the addition of rabbit turds to the pine sap glue. So to make a really effective pine sap glue, you need four parts of fresh pine sap, like the, you know, almost buttery looking like we have it in the picture. Oh, wait, you know what? It helps if I put the picture up, doesn't it? Okay. So uh, four parts of the buttery, sticky, almost honey-like fresh pine sap, one part finely ground charcoal, and one part finely ground, uh, well, partially ground up rabbit droppings. Because rabbits are what are called corprophages. They eat their poop because they have a very ineffective digestive system. So they will, you know, eat some plant. It'll pass through them. They'll turn around and eat that and redigest the undigested plant material and poop it out again. And you know, do several loops like that. Um, and so the thing is, the rabbit pellets are filled with tiny fibers, tiny fibers that when the rabbit turd is broken up and mixed with the pine sap and the charcoal, 
and then the pine sap dries into that hard glassy brittle type thing when it breaks it's still held together by those fibers so the rabbit pellets the fibers from the rabbit pellets work like little tiny bits of rebar holding the glue together even after it cracks oh great question kimberlyn yeah so can you use the pine sap glue to seal where you window paned actually the tree if you wait it will do it itself um side note i talked about how the white pines up north are much tastier than the pine trees down here if i didn't i meant to uh, the loblolly in particular it's a bit on the resiny side it's uh it's still tasty but it's kind of an acquired taste where the white pine is a delicious sort of thing so the reason being is the amount of sap present in the wood up north white pine territory cold a lot not a lot of fungus fungus isn't a big problem down here in the south the loblolly the slash uh, the uh, longleaf when they're damaged there's always fungus around just waiting to get into that tree and destroy it so it needs to have a higher concentration of sap to protect itself from all the fungus so it needs to ooze out and more quickly cover that wound with the sap and make sure it has lots of sap to cover any sort of wounds. So the pine trees down here, very high sap content. Like I said, still edible, but not as edible as the low sap, low fungal infection risk white pines of up north. So again, long story short, if you let it go, it will seal over itself. But generally, especially down here, you want to speed that up. So it's best to paint it over with something, too. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, pine sap glue, four-part sap, one part charcoal, one part crushed up rabbit pellets. Now, there's also cooking with this sap, with this resin. And this started my understanding. So the sap, they used to boil it down as the source of turpentine. The turpentine, the solvent uh comes from the sap and they'd have these big vats of boiling sap and people started throwing like potatoes in it and then chickens in it and would cook the things in the resin and pull it out and when you took the potato or the chicken out uh all but just a very thin layer of this uh pine resin would remain adhered to the potato and give it again kind of a rosemary kind of crispy piney pine potato chip you know coating sort of thing on it like a you know pine fried potatoes uh or chickens and again pascal baldur does that where he takes the sap he roasts the sap or he, he basically distills the turpentine off the sap and then when it's still uh, soft from the heat before it's had a chance to cool. We'll smear it on things and then cook the things with the pine sap and absolutely delicious. So good thing to do there. Uh, yeah. Coat the chicken, coat the potatoes, roast it, and away you go. Okay, Charles, good, 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 good question there. So isn't it bad to cook with the pine? So if you are like making a campfire and want to cook meat over the campfire pine is a bad choice because it burns really fast it burns really hot so there's a good chance you're going to burn the meat on the outside before the inside gets cooked well so that's why you want the uh, hardwoods for a campfire to you know kind of have a better temperature control not so hot and fast but also the when pines burn they do produce a lot of soot and some other resins and things like that. And so it imparts a different flavor than just the resin alone. So yes, normally you do not cook foods with pine. You can boil water with pine if you're doing a bushcraft sort of thing. But generally you don't cook food over a pine fire because yeah, it does put the soot and other stuff in there that doesn't taste as good. Yep. Oh, it's very common ingredient in a number of healing salves. 
Um, in fact, where is the herbs? Does he have? Nope, he doesn't have uh, pine in this one. I know he gave me another one that had pine. So good things there. All right, wow, we're going over. We don't have much left. Okay, so really the last slide of the evening is what is the possible danger of eating pine? And what it is, is in pine needles, in the ponderosa pine and in the lodgepole pine, there is a chemical called isocuperistic acid, blah, 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 blah. Um, and here's the molecule. And the issue with this is this particular compound becomes um, can become fairly high concentration in the ponderosa and slightly less in the lodgepole, uh, especially in the late summer or when the plant is under stress. And it was found then that if cattle at a in the late stage of their pregnancy, so pregnant cattle uh, starts eating some of the ponderosa pine needles or the lodgepole pine needles as browse, you know, as some of the food to eat, uh, it can increase the chance of uh, the cattle undergoing a spontaneous miscarriage or abort, you know, abort abortion. Um, has not been found, or at least there's no recorded case of this happening in humans. That being said, there are lawyers in the world. And so for that reason, uh, if you are pregnant, um, I ask that you don't be doing things with pine needles because you don't want to get the isocuperistic acid in you on the chance that it could cause a miscarriage. Like I said, there's no known case of this happening but it is one of those theoretical things out there. So it's something to keep in mind. Okay, end slideshow. There is one more question. Oops. Here uh, is some, okay, Margarita is asking, is some part of the pine used to heal arthritis? So the pine sap has been used uh, as that, but from a scientific point of view, there hasn't been uh, any good real data on this. Um, and so um, generally as a scientist, I would say there are much better herbs for arthritis than that. Okay, uh, silver linings. Is this acid also in lob lollies? Very, 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 very tiny amounts, but um, I would put the warning on the packaging. Uh, just recommended, you know, if you are a pregnant woman, not to use this. But otherwise, and again, the only reason is to protect yourself from lawyers. So, all right. Uh, oops. oops. Uh, Denver is wondering what you melt the resin down with to make a salve. Beeswax. Yes. So, uh, yeah, the, the traditional way is different oils or beeswax. Beeswax is a great combination with the pine sap. You got to play around some. You like heat it up, add a little you know wax to it, or usually a lot of times they'll add the, well, no, you would normally melt the pine uh, and mix the wax to it, let it cool and see uh, how sticky it is. It does not take a lot of pine sap to give a really good pine scent and some antimicrobial effects to the salve. So you're going to, you know, it's way more than 50-50 uh, with way more beeswax uh, than pine sap. Yep, Lee is correct. Basketry, the roots of certain pine trees had a long history of being used as cordage. The thin branches, the fronds, even the pine needles were all used to make basketry. Cedars are not real pine trees. They are juniperous. Uh, cypress trees are not pine trees. Cedars are not pine trees. The larch is not a pine tree. A Norfolk pine is not a pine tree. So you do need to make sure you have properly identified it as a pine tree. Now, the firs and the balsams are pines. So fir trees you can use, balsam firs, those are good. But the, the cedar are not pines. 
Ah, Carrie, uh, wonder about goats. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I'm sure if you just Googled Ponderosa pine goats or here, let me put the, uh, oops. Oh, it won't let me do that. Okay. I click to exit. Let me do this. Okay. Okay, so that is the the name of the chemical. So you can Google that and run off with that. Okay, uh, Susan Booker, what is the name of the herbalist you keep mentioning? Um, so the forager cook is Pascal Beldour. <laughs> So this guy, the new Wildcraft cuisine, and does he have the resin chicken in here? Sorry, I'm going late, but there's a lot of information with the pine tree. Pine, wow, okay. Cold infusions, grilling with pine needles. Whoa, okay, he has almost like a whole or, okay, pine rosin, 284. 284. Okay, and like, oops, he has a whole section of cooking with the pine rosin. So definitely something to check out. Then on the herbalist side, maybe Sam Thayer. He runs the uh, human path out of Wimberley. Yes, Nancy, spruce trees. Spruce, spruce trees are also pine, so spruce trees are good to go. Um, what else we got here? Oops, new comments. Uh, has something happened to the pine cones recently that the squirrels have abandoned the hickory nuts and are eating the pine cones instead? It's easier for a squirrel to get into the pine cone than it is to get into the hickory nut. So when the pine cones are ripe, that is one of the favorite foods of the squirrels. So, Okay. Uh, at that point, it is 9-11. So that I am going to take a sign to sign off. Hopefully you are now looking at pine trees a little bit differently and all the different ways you can eat, drink, uh, consume the pine. Good tree, good tree, good tree. All right, everyone. Whoops. <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, so the resin could cause an allergic reaction. So if you are allergic to pine trees, you may not want to do the whole resin ro rosin. Once you boil down the sap to you know get most of the turpentine out, it's then called the rosin. Like you know, Johnny rosin up your bow and play your fiddle hard. That the rosin for that that is from the pine trees. Okay, um, cool. All right, people. Again, don't forget uh, tomorrow morning. Sometime before 7.30, the donut shop at the beginning of the world opens up here. Same plant channel, same, well, same plant channel. So the Facebook Foraging Texas page and, of course, the Dr. Mary Weather YouTube page. Every weekday morning, 7.30 to 8 is the 8 a.m. Central time is the donut shop at the beginning of the world. Uh, and it's just a free form conversation, social gathering to rebond with everyone and reaffirm the, the joy of life. Okay. Also, please, you know, I put up the list of the sponsors there, help them out because they are the ones that allow me to put the show on every week. So please give them some of the love um, because they definitely deserve it. Okay. I really. Oh, hey, Tracy. <laughs> Oops. So Tracy, we, we were in grad school together. She's like one of the most loveliest people on the planet. Okay, tribe. Miss you, Tracy. Miss you so much. And I will see a lot of you tomorrow morning. Like I said, 730-ish. Usually I start before then. But have a great evening. 
Go out, hug a pine tree, tell it how much you now respect it, and I will see you later. Good night.